Hi, I'm Chris Swan. Welcome to my Flood of Vikings talk on Full Stack Dart. So I'll start out with uh, a brief introduction of myself. I'm an engineer at the App Company, where we're building a platform that puts people in control of their data. The way I describe this is we're giving everybody and everything on the internet a tiny little server so that they can store their data there and be in control of who has access to that. I'm also the co-host of the Tech Debt Burndown podcast, uh, a cloud editor at InfoQ, and I keep a blog at thestateofme.com. You can find links to all my socials, etc., at chris.swans.net, and I'll have some contact information at the end of the day. So here's my agenda. I'm going to start off talking about why Dart. Why is it relevant to talk about full stack Dart and then look at uh, some of the trade-offs between just-in-time compilation and ahead-of-time compilation. One of the great things about Dart is having those choices, uh, but that means that you've got to actually make a choice between one or the other. I'm going to talk about Dart on Docker uh, and look at what's involved in uh, creating Docker files and building images, uh, especially images that contain AOT binaries. I'll touch upon the functions framework for Dart because this is something that Google have created to make it much easier uh, to build functions-based uh, backends uh, using the Dart language. And take a look at profiling and performance management. Uh, Dart as a relatively uh, recent language uh, has got some amazing tools built into it. So things that have previously been uh, paid for third-party extras uh, for lots of other languages come in the box uh, with Dart and uh, very easy to access. Then to look at uh, backend architectures. Uh, and so uh, we now have great choices between x86 uh, and ARM architectures, but there's some trade-offs uh, involved in uh, choosing those, uh, particularly when looking at uh, how we manage continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, pipelines. Then look at other places uh, where you can learn more. And I'm going to finish with a call to action, uh, which is try out the dark framework function example. Uh, the really good way of just kind of getting in and trying something out quickly. So why Dart? Well, let's start out just with a an, reintroduction of, of what Dart is and what it was put into the world for. Dart is a client optimized language for fast apps on any platform. You can find out uh, all of the core information about Dart at dart.dev. But this is a Flutter conference. So if you're using Flutter, you've already come across Dart as the thing that's underneath Flutter. And in fact, Flutter is uh, the thing that's really pulled Dart into uh, the top languages. So there's a research company called Redmunk, and every six months uh, they produce uh, a languages ranking. Uh, that's created uh, by looking at uh, both GitHub and Stack Overflow uh, to see how much people are using languages and how much people are talking about using languages. Uh, and from that, uh, they compile a top 20 uh, and they take a close look at the languages that are up and coming. So at the start of 2021, Dart was identified as one of the up and coming languages, uh, and that was being driven by Flutter adoption. And then as we got to summer of 2021, uh, and the most recent report at the time that I'm recording this, uh, Dart had just made it into uh, the top 20, uh, displacing Perl uh, from what had been there before. And so you can see the languages above Dart in popularity at the moment uh, are all pretty familiar names. Uh, they're all very popular languages. Uh, but Dart's uh, established itself now in that list. And that's largely because of the popularity of Flutter uh, as a back-end language, as a front-end language. So if you're attending a Flutter event, you're probably writing Dart already. So why not use it for the back end as well as the front end? And I think that's the thinking behind uh, this idea of full stack Dart. All right, so let's look at the different types of 
uh, runtime and compilation that Dart makes available to us uh, and the trade-offs between just-in-time and ahead of time. So I've uh, got a trivial application here called Dart Show Platform, uh, which I treat as being a more useful version of Hello World. And when it runs, it prints out some uh, platform version information. So exactly the same kind of information you'd get if you ran Dart minus version, uh, but it's just uh, a simple application that's doing that. So I'm um, importing Dart IO, show platform and standard out, and then avoid main to print platform dot version. And the example output of that uh, is below there. So you can see at the time that I ran this to create the slide, I was running Dart 214.4 on a Linux machine on an ARM architecture. So with just-in-time, I can uh, take that uh, Dart source file and run it in the Dart virtual machine. Uh, and if I put the time command before that, I can see how long it takes. So in this case, you can see on the particular device I was using, that trivial application took a little over six seconds uh, to run and produce its output which is quite a wait. So that's the time that it takes to spin up the Dart VM, uh, to turn the uh, source code uh, into bytecode, um, and then to run that bytecode and show some output. So we can do a lot better than that uh, because that's what's typically known as the cold start problem. We've, we've started from zero and it's taken uh, quite a considerable amount of time to run something that's got trivial output. And uh, if we're trying to run Dart in this way on a back end, we don't want our users waiting all of that time uh, for the Dart virtual machine to spin up. Um, so ideally, the Dart virtual machine will already be spun up. Uh, and better yet, uh, because it's got a just-in-time compiler within it, uh, we'll be running the same code time and time again so that the just-in-time compiler can optimize across those runs. So our alternative is to do ahead of time compilation, uh, compile the application first and then run the binary. So we can do this with Dart compile exe, show platform dot Dart, and then we can time the execution of the ex time the execution time of the uh, binary produced by that. And so in this case, we can see that it takes uh, a, about twenty eight milliseconds. Uh, to run a trivial application, which is much more like it. So no hanging around for six seconds for the VM to start up, uh, just a really snappy output uh, from the application. But of course, there's a trade-off with this. The compilation process itself uh, is slow uh, or comparatively slow. So if I time the compilation process, we can see that that's taking in the region of 20 seconds uh, in order to compile uh, the executable into that platform native binary. Now, in many cases, this isn't going to matter because that compilation time is going to be taking place within a build pipeline and users aren't going to be experiencing that. So it's a, a, a minor hit at build time uh, in order to give much better performance at execution time. But bear in mind as well that uh, when using ahead of time compilation, there's no opportunity for the virtual machine to optimize across the code paths that it's seeing being executed. And so ahead of time binaries may not be quite optimal uh, versus a, a long running virtual machine. Okay, so moving on then to Dart on Docker. Here's a typical Docker file for an ahead of time compiled uh, Dart binary. Um, and it's a two stage Docker file. So at the first stage, I'm using from Dart, and I'm declaring that as my build uh, image. Uh, and this is taking the uh, Dart official uh, Docker image uh, and setting up a working directory, copying some code in there, uh, running pub get in order to fetch some dependencies, uh, and then compiling the executable uh, into a native binary. We then move into the second stage uh, of the build. And we're starting off then from the scratch image. Uh, and the scratch image is a special image, which is just zero bytes. 
uh, it's completely empty. Now, Dart doesn't create statically linked binaries. Uh, it needs uh, dynamic linked runtime underneath it. So essentially, uh, libc and uh, a bunch of other uh, dependencies. Uh, but they're all collected for us in the runtime directory uh, within the official uh, Docker Dart image. Uh, and so we can simply copy those from build uh, into uh, the root directory uh, of the Scratch image. And then with those in place, we've got the minimal dependencies for the static for the linked application, uh, and we can copy the application in and uh, define an entry point into that application in order to run it. So if we look then at the image sizes uh, for that trivial application, they're pretty small. Uh, the application itself is tiny, and the, um, the runtime dependencies uh, are also uh, relatively lightweight. So we can see on um, an x64 uh, platform here, it's just under 4.5 megs, uh, whereas on an ARM v7 platform, it's uh, just over 3.2. Uh, with ARM64 uh, on V8 somewhere in the middle there. And it's actually not much different uh, for a non-trivial application. Uh, so here's a, a snapshot that I took of our uh, secondary server. Um, so when we say that we're running a server for uh, everybody on the internet, um, these are tiny containers uh, that have got uh, compiled uh, Dart native binaries inside of them. Uh, and you can see that those binaries are ranging from uh, 5 megs on ARM uh, to 6 megs on uh, AMD64. So turning to the functions framework for Dart. So this can be found uh, on GitHub at Google Cloud Platform functions-framework-dart. And the framework is there to provide a, a way to write lightweight functions uh, that can run in a variety of different environments. Um, so they can include uh, a local development machine, <coughs> uh, Google Cloud Run, uh, and there's even a, a Cloud Run Quick Start, uh, Google App Engine, or Knative based environments on top of Kubernetes. And you know, to quote the page here, Google Cloud Functions does not currently provide an officially supported Dart language runtime, but we're working on making Google Cloud run as seamless and symmetric an experience as possible for Dart Function Frameworks projects. So what that's essentially saying is we can't just take Dart code and run it on Google Cloud Functions uh, because it's not supported, but we can take Dart code, put it into containers and run it on Google Cloud Run. And the Functions Framework is making it super easy to write Dart code that implements functions. So let's take a quick look at what that looks like. So from the examples of really a, a hello world kind of an example here, just importing uh, a couple of uh, things. So the, the functions framework itself uh, and a package called shelf, we're then declaring uh, a cloud function uh, and saying that the response from that function to a request is going to be response to OK, hello world. Uh, and you know, having then built that, uh, we will get from the build process uh, an app URL. And from a command line, uh, we can run curl against that app URL and we will get back hello world. And so all of that's been done without any need to worry about writing an HTTP server or request handling logic or any of that plumbing kind of work, that's all just been taken care of. Uh, and so that leaves developers to simply concentrate uh, on their application, uh, the data management that's going on within it, um, and the business functionality provided. Moving on then to profiling and performance management. So, if you've been building Flutter applications, you might already be familiar with Dart DevTools. But if you haven't come across Dart DevTools already, then it's a really excellent um, set of uh, tools that come with Dart that help you understand uh, how your application is behaving and performing. And so the suite of DevTools includes a debugger, 
a logging view, an app size tool, a CPU profiler, a memory view, a network view, performance view, and Flutter Inspector. And you can see from this table that that complete suite of tools is available to developers for Flutter mobile and desktop applications. But aside from Flutter Inspector, all of those tools are also available for developing a command line uh, dot application. Uh, and that means that if you're getting into full stack Dart, you can use the same dev tools for the front end and the back end uh, in order to understand application performance. So here, for example, is the memory view. And you know, this is particularly useful for understanding uh, what's going on with uh, things like garbage collection. Uh, so uh, the view is giving indications of when uh, garbage collection events are taking place. Uh, and that will uh, help understand when uh, the application might be pausing uh, because of uh, a garbage collection. Uh, it also gives a great indication of how much garbage uh, the application is creating and how much stress is being put onto the garbage collector. Uh, and there's often lots of ways that uh, the code can be redone in order to, to minimize garbage creation uh, and uh, maximize performance as a result of that. Uh, flame chart is an ideal way of understanding uh, the, the call stack and where time is being spent uh, in parts of uh, an application. Uh, so this is really useful for um, diagnosing uh, possible performance issues and where they can be localized. But there's a little bit of a gotcha uh, when it comes to um, the back end because dev tools need to connect to a virtual machine. And so dev tools can only be used with uh, the just-in-time uh, compiled uh, approach to uh, running applications. Uh, and so I, I reached out to one of the uh, Dart SDK uh, core engineers who's published some great blog posts uh, on the topic of Dart uh, performance and profiling and asked him about um, whether it would be possible to get metrics out of an AT AOT binary. And you can see from his answer here um, <laughs> that it is possible, but it is a bit complicated. Uh, and so uh, his suggestion to me was uh, to go and compile my own SDK and, and change um, some of the parameters uh, to do that. And this is the first time I've come across um, things that, that would make me want to compile my own SDK. Uh, but it's you know, a complicated endeavor, and it's also something where uh, once you start doing that, then you also then need to keep up with SDK releases. So it becomes a bit of an ongoing overhead. So that's not something I've done yet with the AOT binaries uh, that we work with. What we've ended up um, taking as our approach instead is where we're trying to identify performance issues. Uh, we will actually switch um, from the AOT environment into a VM environment. Uh, and then connect the Dart dev tools to that. Uh, and we refer to that as a, an observable secondary. So if we're normally running a secondary server um, and having a very small footprint with that, the observable secondary has got a slightly larger footprint and it has uh, the startup time associated with uh, the cold start of the VM. But actually once that's started up, we can then start getting um, a lot of the Dart dev tools data out of it uh, to understand the performance. Uh, of the application. All right, so looking at um, some of the options for backend architecture then. So the Dart SDK uh, supports all of the, the popular operating systems and associated architectures that go with them. So Linux, Mac OS, and Windows are all supported as of Dart 2.15 across these architectures. So you can see it's a little bit more um, of a wide range on Linux. Uh, so we've got uh, x86, 64-bit and 32-bit flavors, and ARM, 64-bit and 32-bit flavors. Uh, whereas on Mac OS, uh, we've now got full ARM support for the new M1 chips, uh, which is a, a good thing. And then on Windows, 
uh, there's x86 for uh, 64 bit and 32 bit, but no ARM support. So I think about readily available in the cloud. Most cases, uh, I'm certainly not willing to pay for a Windows license just for running some binaries. Um, and so the operating system choice normally defaults to Linux for that reason. Uh, and architecture wise in the cloud, uh, x86 64 is uh, the typical default, uh, but ARM v8 um, is becoming much more common uh, and generally has the better performance price point. Um, and that performance is often greener as well. Um, and so using less energy um, and, and thus being more sustainable. Then if we look at IoT platforms, uh, it tends to be ARM all the way. Um, now, there are IoT platforms that use other architectures like MIPS, uh, but uh, MIPS isn't the supported architecture for, DARMs, uh, for Dart, so that's kind of irrelevant. Um, RISC-V is um, coming along, uh, but again, no support from Dart on that yet. Uh, and so really that kind of focuses our effort onto ARM v8 and ARM v7. So with Docker, uh, there's a part of Docker called Buildex, uh, which is the, the latest build environment. And that can build ARM images on uh, x86 64 bit. And so what that means is it's possible to generate multi-platform images from hosted CI CD pipelines, such as GitHub Actions. But there's a few gotchas. So it uses uh, a thing called QMU, uh, and that can be slow. Uh, and that slowness can then affect um, commit cycles uh, within CI pipelines. I'd also note that it's pretty reliable for ARM v8, uh, but with Dart, not very much so for, for ARM v7. So there's a number of uh, well understood and now reasonably well documented um, problems with compiling ARM v7 binaries uh, inside of emulation uh, within uh, Docker Buildex. Uh, and so the, the upshot of that is if you want to build on v7 images, um, then it's not practical to do that uh, using emulation. That has to be uh, done on native silicon. So what then of building multi-platform images without using Buildex? Well, doing that, it means each architecture has to be built on its own underlying hardware. Uh, so we can normally build x64 in the regular CI type of environments. Um, and if we're not using hosted CI, there's still plenty of choice of places to, to find x86 64-bit hardware out there. Um, things like AWS Graviton instances uh, can be used for building the ARM v8. And for ARM v7, uh, Raspberry Pis tend to be the reason for doing it and hence um, they become a, a good place to actually do the building as well. And there's um, hosts like Mythic Beasts uh, have Raspberry Pis uh, as a service. Um, so those can be used in similar kind of way to, to any kind of infrastructure as a service uh, in the mainstream cloud. So once an image has been created for each of the architectures, um, that then needs to be stitched together into a multi-platform manifest. Uh, which is assembled from the platform specific images. Uh, and that manifest process can be run on, on any of the architectures. Uh, it just needs to have sight of the, um, the images for the platform specific pieces. All right, so where else can you find out a bit more about uh, this stuff? So last year, there were a couple of uh, good sessions in Google I.O. Uh, one was an Ask Me Anything on uh, Cloud Dart and Full Stack Flutter. Uh, and the other was um, a talk on going full stack with uh, Kotlin or Dart on Google Cloud. Um, and so you see some, um, some of the same faces on those. Uh, so Tony Pujols uh, was uh, a speaker on both. And uh, he's been very much involved in um, getting uh, Dart on Docker uh, kicked into good shape uh, and uh, one of the official uh, Docker images. Uh, you can also hear from Tony uh, and Kevin Moore on uh, 
the topic of full stack Dart on one of the GCP podcast episodes. And uh, I've got my personal uh, kind of collection of links about Dart stuff uh, on Pinboard. Uh, so uh, take a look at that. Um, uh, for instance, you can see there a link to the micro, micro benchmarking Dart article, uh, which was uh, what led me into the conversation with the Google engineer that I referred to earlier. All right, call to action. Try out the functions framework examples. Uh, and one way of doing that is with Quick Labs. Um, so if you've not come across Quick Labs, Quick Labs is uh, Google's um, hosted learning platform uh, where they'll spin up temporary Google Cloud Platform uh, environments uh, that can be used to try stuff out. Um, and there's a Quick Labs um, dedicated to the Dart Functions framework. So that gives you a, a hosted way of, of doing that. And you can get a free Quick Labs account uh, by signing up to the Cloud Skills Challenge. Uh, so just follow that link. Um, it offers a range of challenges, but all of them come with 30 days of free access to Quick Labs. Um, and it's not just Dart Functions Framework that you'll find there. Um, there's some Flutter material as well. You can also try out some of the other courses um, on, on things like Functions Framework and Cloud Run um, and you know, the more general ways that Google have got to support backend. Okay, we're pretty much at the end. So a quick review. Uh, I started off looking at why Dart. Uh, and I think for this in audience in particular, the answer is you've already taken the time to learn Dart to do Flutter on the front end. So why not use Dart uh, to write the back end uh, and then have a full stack Dart application? I've looked at the trade-offs between just-in-time and ahead-of-time. Uh, so just-in-time uh, has a, a bit of a cold start problem, uh, but can potentially optimize very well in the long run, uh, whereas ahead-of-time is going to run super quickly, um, but won't be able to optimize over time. And there's also the hit of compiling things to be uh, ahead-of-time ready, but that will normally take place in the build pipeline. Uh, that build pipeline will often be creating Docker images, uh, which is why I spent some time uh, looking at Dart on Docker. And the functions framework for Dart uh, is a way of really simplifying the code that needs to be written uh, to go into those Docker containers. Dart DevTools provides some amazing tools for profiling and performance management, uh, so they're well worth checking out. Uh, and then for backend architecture, there's some trade-offs between x86 and ARM. Uh, so ARM is increasingly popular. Uh, but building for x86 and ARM at the moment uh, still has some challenges, especially since a lot of the hosted CI-CD pipelines uh, that we use at the moment still are x86-based. Touched upon some other places where you can learn more, and my call to action is try some of this stuff out, and uh, I think the best place to start is with the functions framework examples. So if you'd uh, like to contact me um, afterwards to talk about any of this stuff, I'm Chris Swan. Uh, you can reach me uh, chris at chris sign.com by email uh, and also find me as at cpswan, uh, not just on the app platform, but uh, most other places on the internet. And if you want to try out the app platform, uh, you can find out about it at, at sign.dev uh, or go to our GitHub uh, organization, at sign foundation. Uh, or see activity on Twitter, or join our Discord community with that QR code. And now, I think we'll be cutting across to some questions. So I look forward to hearing uh, what you'd like to know more about in terms of full stack Dart. Thanks for watching.